things. Okay, so an 11-year-old girl is healed of pleurisy and bron bronchitis due to prayer. Uh, a childless woman conceived after 13 years. A husband's business is saved from impending disaster. A husband returns to the faith. A deathbed recovery affected. So ladies of the leisure class again. Um, so these are the kinds of things they're praying for. They're praying the, sa the same kind of concerns that we have. They're bringing them to the Lord in prayer, the holy sacrifice. All right. So what happened as a result of this? Well, they obviously were speaking to a need because within 50 years there were over a million members of the confraternity in France, Germany, and America. Whoops, that's supposed to say Germany. All right. Um, they obtained the approval of Pius IX. He said, we already have confraternities for all ages and all needs and all conditions in life except for the mothers of families. Now in this our age, it's precisely the family which is attacked by modern impiety. So Pope Pius IX gave his specific approbation and then Pope, whoops, another typo. That's supposed to say Pope Leo XIII. Um, so disregard that, not Pope Leo XII. Pope Leo XIII found the American Arch Confraternity um, to which he granted special indulgences. Um, U.S. Foundation in 1880, St. Augustine's Church, Pittsburgh, PA. So, um, and I pulled that out of the Champlain Educator of 1903, believe it or not. Okay, so what came of it? What were the results of the confraternity in France? Well, we already pointed out, unfortunately, the mothers did not achieve one of their aims, which was the re-Christianization of French society. Um, this, uh, this is a French sociologist of religion at the Paris Institute for Political Studies. He says, today it's unimaginable to go against the state, against the public space, to show a cross or a skullcap or a veil. It's impossible. It's wanting to destroy the state. That's how it's perceived. That's what the French feel. Most French people think that you cannot be a citizen and believe in God. And this is what Father alluded to at the beginning. We are the most, most atheistic people in the world. All right, so at one level, you'd have to say that the, that the confraternity and the Christian mothers and those like them failed in their aims of re-Christianizing France. So were they a complete failure? All right, well, no, I don't think so. I found this picture. I thought it was a, a beautiful and ironic picture of the state of religion in France today. You see Notre Dame in the background there, all the, all the um, reporters gathered around what? A Catholic woman? No, no, a Muslim woman. And the issue, of course, now where secularism is being challenged is not from the Catholics, it's from the Muslims. Muslim women who want to wear veils and other displays of religiosity in public and in the schools and workplaces and so forth, and they're being told they can't, all right, because no religion are allowed in public spaces in France. All right, so do we conclude then, do we conclude then that the, that the confraternity of Christian mothers, uh, because they weren't successful in re-Christianizing France, uh, were they therefore unsuccessful, all right? Should we uh, think that their example is not to be followed? No, I don't think so. And the heritage, the heritage of Christian motherhood, Catholic motherhood in France is, is one of the most astonishing heritages given to the, to the universal church, I believe, all right? And I just pulled three uh, incredible Christian saints, female Christian saints from this very same period, 19th century France, um, one of whom was a mother, of course. Now, you should recognize all these, I think. Um, Bernadette Subaru, of course, up on the top left. Um, Catherine Labore, and does anybody know who this is in the middle? Therese? Nope. No, her mother? Yep. Zélie Martin. Zélie Martin. Um, and uh, I, I think Zélie Martin in particular is interesting because, well, I'm not aware that she was a member of the Confraternity of Christian Mothers. She knew them. I mean, she had to because she, she came from the exact same social media. She lived in the north of France. She was bourgeoisie. Um, she was a very pious and devoted Catholic. If you ever read her letters um, to her husband and to her family members, they're, they're just filled with, with faith and piety. And, uh, and, of course, she gave to the world one of the greatest gifts that the Catholic world has ever seen, very much like St. Monica gave us St. Augustine, Zélie Martin gave us St. Thérèse of Vizieux. Okay, and St. Therese has been responsible for more conversions, more vocations, more calls to a deeper and contemplative life, not only in France, but throughout the whole Catholic world of the 20th century than, than perhaps any other modern saint of the last 300 years. And so, uh, you know, while St. Therese didn't come immediately from the confraternity of Christian mothers, she came very much from that social theological and devotional milieu of northern France, 9th century female Catholicism. This is where she came from. And, and uh, you know, I was particularly moved uh, 
Thomas Martin, who some of you know, he, he started strong and finished weak, you know, so I don't have an unqualified endorsement of Thomas Merton, but Merton's early work is very interesting, and he was deeply moved by Therese of Lisieux, and he, he was better on the left uh, politically. He was uh, sympathetic to socialism and, and various causes of that sort, and, uh, and he had an absolute disdain for the French bourgeoisie. He couldn't stand that social class because of his own biases, all right? But when he discovered St. Therese, she just whacked him upside the head. And I love, I love what he has to say about her. And he fell in love with Therese of Lisieux. And he says, the big president that was given to me that October, and he's writing 1948-ish now, that in the order of grace, was the discovery that the real, little flower really was a saint, really was a saint, and not just a mute, pious little doll in the imaginations of a lot of sentimental old women. And not only was she a saint, but she was a great saint, one of the greatest, tremendous. I owe her all kinds of public apologies and reparation for having ignored her greatness for so long. It was never, could never be any surprise to me that saints should be found in the misery and sorrow and suffering of Harlem or in the leper colonies like Father Damien's Molokai or in the slums of John Bosco's Turin or on the roads of Umbria in the time of St. Francis on in the hidden Cistercian abbeys of the 12th century of the Grand Chartres, or St. Jerome's cave with a lion guarding his library, or Simon's pillar. All this was obvious. These things were strong and mighty reactions in ages and situations that called for spectacular heroism. But what astonished me altogether was the appearance of a saint in the midst of all the stuffy, overplush, over-decorated, comfortable ugliness and mediocrity of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> I, I got such a kick out of that. Um, and uh, how many of you knew that Dorothy Day, who is if nothing if not the epitome of socially conscious uh, American Catholicism, Dorothy Day was powerfully attracted to St. Therese of Lisieux. She wrote a biography of Therese of Lisieux, in fact. And, uh, and like, like Merton, she initially was kind of repulsed by Therese, but the more she thought about her and studied her and read her life, the more deeply and deeply she was moved by her. And uh, in her biography of Therese, uh, she says, either the little flower is looked upon, perhaps because of her nickname with sentimentality, or as one get to gets to know her better with dread. Now, why would one approach the little flower with dread? Um, and I think it's because, and this is what, this is Day's analysis, that, that in the life of Therese of Lisieux, in her very soul was lived out this incredible battle, this conflict between these two ways of being human that were at war in France. And Therese experienced this interiorly and suffered profoundly this battle in her soul and won. And you know, she had her dark night where she doubted the very existence of God. And Dorothy writes, on that frail battleground of her flesh was fought the wars of today. When she died, her bones were piercing her body and she died in an agony of both flesh and spirit. She was tempted against the faith and yet and said that for the last years of her life, she was forced herself to believe with her indomitable will while a mocking voice cry, cried in her ears that there was neither heaven nor hell, and she was flinging away her wife for nothing, her life for nothing. To her, God was a consuming flame. And I think that's a, a, a brilliant image of the significance of Therese of Lisieux for our age, given to us, of course, by the society that also gave us the confraternity of Christian mothers. Um, but I particularly want to commend to your attention Elizabeth Lesore, whose calls for canonization is currently open at the Holy See. Do you know, anybody know Elizabeth Lesore? I know a couple of you do. All right. I highly recommend you get a hold of her, the, the secret diary of Elizabeth Lesore. The reason why is that Lesore wasn't just a product of this 19th century French feminine spirituality, but she lived in her own life this conflict uh, very, very profoundly. Her husband was a very prominent atheist free thinker, anti-clerical, he was the editor of an anti-clerical publication. The circles that they hung in were, were deeply anti-clerical, anti-religious, and, uh, and he was brilliant, and he tried constantly to undermine her faith. And she was deeply pious and devoted. She loved her husband deeply, and in spite of this, they had a good marriage. Um, the interesting thing is, and why I'm so attracted to Elizabeth Lesseur, is that in her own life, she completely overturned all of the stereotypes of 19th century feminine spirituality. Uh, their detractors saw the church as reactionary and narrow-minded and bigoted and intolerant and, and uneducated and ignorant and, and you name it. They, they were, you know, throw out your, your, your slur. This is how they saw the church. 
And Elizabeth was, was the opposite. She was brilliantly intelligent, highly educated,